What's up scholars, it's Kaden with Black Books Animated. Today I'm going to explain redlining to you. If you're easily triggered, you probably should not watch this video, but go ahead and smash that like button for me anyways. Redlining in the United States is a discriminatory practice in which financial and otherwise services were denied to residents of certain communities because of their race or ethnicity aka black people. Redlining was supercharged due to the New Deal. The bulk of the New Deal reforms can be described as white affirmative action because states' resources were used to provide direct financial advantages to white Americans at the expense of other racial groups. And this outcome was no accident. The only way Roosevelt could enact his progressive platform was with the backing of the Senate Southern Democrats. And this strong, influential, and coherent political wing of the party was adamant that their economic structure and racial hierarchy must be protected. Roosevelt had to make a choice between equal treatment of the races or large-scale historic social reform. He chose the latter and and the choice had long-lasting effects. Without explicit racial exclusion, the laws were crafted in such a way as to exclude most blacks from the social welfare programs. For example, most blacks in the South were farm workers and domestic workers. In devising legislation that regulated work hours, it enabled unions and set minimum wages and established social security. The Southern Bloc excluded both groups and thus the majority of black Southerners from the protective legislation. The purpose of these exclusions, as expressed by Southern legislators, was to maintain the inferior status of black laborers in the Southern economy. You cannot put the Negro and the white man on the same basis and get away with it, remarked Florida's representative James Mark Wilcox. The new credit and banking agencies created by the New Deal, Homeowners Loan Corporation, HOLC, the Federal Home Loan Banks, FHLB, the Federal National Mortgage Association, FNMA, or Fannie Mae, the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, were all geared towards the rapid and effective dissemination of low-cost credit to new homeowners. These agencies, coupled with post-war economic growth, created a robust home-owning capital creating and predominantly white middle class. They also made the black ghetto a permanent and feature of the 20th century. Government fuel mortgage markets offered the white middle class an escape from the cities even as it trapped the black poor within them. Consequently, race became the primary determinant of home ownership for the next century. Before banks pump mortgage credit into American suburbs, the Homeowners Loan Corporation faithfully mapped out America's racial geography. The HELC permanently changed mortgage lending in the United States by simplifying and streamlining the home mortgage. Part of the streamlining process was the creation of standardized home appraisal. HOLC appraisers use census data and elaborate questionnaires to predict the likelihood of property appreciation in neighborhoods across the country. The HOLC then used this data to create meticulous maps giving each metropolitan region and neighborhood across the country a value. These maps had color score categories based on perceived risk. A. Green, B. Blue, Yellow, C, and D. Red. Green being the most desirable and red being the least. In making judgment about a home potential to appreciate, HOLC map makers, like individual appraisers before them, used the race of residents as the proxy for desirability. Green neighborhoods were homogeneous and white. At the other end of the scale, the red neighborhoods were predominantly black. In fact, race was a greater factor in a neighborhood's predicted decline than other structural characteristics such as age of homes, proximity to city centers, credit worthiness of residents, transportation opportunities, public parks, or any other feature. These designations became a self-fulfilling prophecy. This process of redlining eventually created a dual credit market based on race. 
The HOLC appraisers did not create the ghetto, and they were no more racist than the broader American public, but they did institutionalize racial segregation in housing and made it a formal feature of mortgage credit markets. This not only meant that blacks could not buy homes and build capital in the undesirable inner city, it also meant that they were trapped in neighborhoods in rapid decline, having been defined as such by the self-reinforcing judgments of government bureaucrats. The reason these maps lingered for so long was that private banks used them as models when creating their own residential security maps and deciding where to lend. Even this discriminatory practice might have abated with time had the Federal Housing Administration, FHA, and the Veterans Administration, VA, not used it for their more consequential mortgage programs. The FHA did more to shape American life than any other government agency created during the New Deal. It is also unparalleled in the injustice its policies wrought on the black population. The FHA created by the National Housing Act of 1935 and was supplemented and expanded through the 1944 Servicemen's Readjustment Act, the GI Bill, administered by the VA. Between 1934 and 1968, the FHA and VA programs operated to open a spigot of mortgage lending that flowed through the banking system. The FHA did not lend money itself, but it created a large insurance fund backed by the U.S. Treasury that would guarantee all approved mortgage loans which shifted the bulk of the risk of loan default from banks to the government. By creating a buffer to absorb default risk, the new government infrastructure opened the floodgates for an unprecedented amount of private capital to flood the mortgage market. Virtually overnight, mortgage loan became easy, risk-free, and abundant. Banks increasingly relied on the protocols and standard provided by the government agencies that were insuring the mortgages and managing their resale. Interest rates and terms converged, as did the types of borrowers. Banks were much less likely to take risk on borrowers who did not fit the gold standard, which was white, middle class, and male. Yet to call those who qualify for the loans the middle class is an evasive and circular description. Many were blue-collar workers, but it was precisely through these mortgages that they became the much herald American middle class. These borrowers would not have been able to buy homes before these reforms. Over half of the mortgage borrowers earned less than $2,500 per year, or the equivalent to $40,000 in 2017. After these programs, mortgage loans became far more accessible to white people. As banks significantly reduced down payment requirements, lengthened loan terms, and slashed interest rates, in this new market, borrowers could pay less in mortgage payments than they had been paying in rent. The prosperity fueled by the abundant flow of mortgage credit stopped firmly at the red lines around the black ghettos. The protocols and standards of the FHA pushed whites up and out of the cities and into the suburbs, but they held blacks in. The discriminatory policies of the FHA were even more explicit than the HOLC map making. The bureaucracy was now actually enforcing segregation. The FHA 1939 underwriting manual explicitly prohibited lending in neighborhoods that were changing in racial composition. In a 1941 memo, the FHA unapologetically explained that the rapidly rising Negro population has produced a problem in the maintenance of real estate values. A good neighborhood, according to the FHA, was one that prevented inharmonious racial groups, which meant that only groups that did not threaten property values were white families. Once the FHA made its preferences clear, the natural operations of the credit market created racially pure white suburbs, enforcing racial purity or a harmonious racial mix, as they would say, became a vested interest of homeowners, realtors, and banks, all whom held a financial stake in the mortgages. 
the FHA even offered suggestions for the best way of achieving this result, which they said was through race-based subdivision, regulation, and suitable restrictive covenants. Racial covenants were promises made by homeowners that they would never sell rent or lease their homes to non-whites, guaranteeing that a neighborhood could sue any white homeowner who stepped out of lines by selling to blacks. The FHA only stopped recommending racial covenants in February 1950, two years after the Supreme Court found such covenants unenforceable in the landmark 1948 case Shelley v. Kramer. All right, family, most of this information comes from the book, The Color of Money, Black Banks, and the Racial Wealth Gap by Mercer Baradaran. If you want to learn more, certainly pick up a copy of this book. The link will be in the description. I highly recommend it. Don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. And remember, knowledge is power, but knowledge shared is power multiplied.